Thank you for tuning in today and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, San Reza. And today I'll be talking to Fabian Scheidler about the latest developments surrounding the bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline. Fabian Scheidler is an independent journalist and an author. As an author, he has written several books, the latest being The End of the Mega Machine, A Brief History of a Failing Civilization. Fabian, welcome back to the show. Welcome, Zane. Thank you for, thank you for having me. In February, you interviewed world-renowned Pulitzer Prize investigative journalist Seema Hirsch, who had released an article based on an anonymous source that detailed how the U.S. bombed the Nord Stream pipeline. For those that missed this interview on our channel, be sure to click in the link in the description below. A few weeks later, the New York Times released an article based on anonymous U.S. intelligence sources that claimed a rock group used a yacht from Rockstock to bomb the Nord Stream pipeline. They found traces of explosive material as well as fake IDs on the yacht. They ruled out any involvement of any British or American citizens. Following the New York Times article, the German media led by the site, the Spiegel, conducted their own investigations and more or less came to the same conclusion that the perpetrators may be a rogue pro-Ukrainian group that is not affiliated with the Ukrainian government or is some Russian anti-Putin group. In March, you released an article in the Berliner Zeitung in which you analyze the story of the mainstream media. Can you share your findings and what you were able to uncover? Yes, you know, the funny thing is uh, that when the New York Times and Die Zeit came up with their sailboat story, uh, in the New York Times especially, uh, Julian Barnes, one of the authors of the New York Times article, claimed in a podcast of the New York Times that, uh, well, we finally have sort of resolved the case. Uh, and at the end of uh, that very podcast, he said, well, I have to say that we know very little. It remains a mystery. It remains even a mystery to the sources to which we talked. And the sources were so-called U.S. officials who had um, surveyed some sort of intelligence and so on and so forth. And uh, when you look at the details of this story, uh, it's very improbable that it could have happened that way. Uh, I mean, a sailboat with six, six persons on it. Uh, the government investigators uh, of Sweden, Denmark and Germany, they haven't said much yet, which is astonishing given the scope of, of the attacks. But what they said it, is that it must have been a state actor. It's a complex military operation at some, that some six people on a sailboat do such a thing is uh, hard to believe. And if you look in the details, it's almost impossible. You need a decompression chamber because you have to go 80 meters deep. And to, to do such an operation, you have to decompress for a long time. Otherwise, you need a decompression chamber. It cannot be put on such a sailboat. You cannot even anchor such a sailboat in 80 meters depth. So, and you need a lot of other equipment, which was apparently not on the boat, and so on and so forth. Another detail which is interesting is that uh, um, the the German persecutors um, claim, according to Die Zeit, that there was a trace of explosives on the kitchen table of the yacht. Now, they uh, investigated the boat in January. The attacks, remember, happened in September. That, that was four months later. So uh, two questions about that. If they were professionals, and they must have been professionals to do such an operation, why were they not able to clean the kitchen table? I mean, it's ridiculous. That's the first question. And uh, the, the author of this article in Die Zeit um, answered it by himself uh, by saying, well, probably they didn't have enough time to clean the table. Well, he must have known that you need at least two days from the location of the attacks to Rostock, where the, the yacht was located. Not enough time to clean up the table I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and the second point is that you, when you use professional, probably C4 underwater explosives, usually they do not leave any traces because they have to be packed. Hmm. They're wrapped in plastic. So this whole story is really remarkable. And what is most remarkable is that our investigative reporters do not investigate these questions. I mean, Holger Stark is the chief of the investigative uh, department of Die Zeit, which is the biggest German uh, newspaper. And he doesn't ask the, the crucial questions. No? 
So uh, this story is is hard to believe. And what is more interestingly interesting even is uh, the the date when it came up. I mean, four weeks earlier, Seymour Hirsch released his very detailed article uh, claiming that the U.S. did the attacks with the help of Norwegian forces. And uh, I think that Seymour Hirsch's report is um, much more credible. I mean, we don't know the truth uh, yet, but it's much more credible than the other stories for many reasons. One reason is that the U.S., said that they would do it. Do it. Remember, um, President Biden himself said on February 7, 2022, that was before the invasion, uh, uh, in a press conference in the White House, standing next to the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, he said, uh, we will end this pipeline if Russia invades Ukraine. And then a German reporter asked, uh, he very stunned, well, how are you going to do this? I mean, this is uh, German infrastructure. He, he smiled and said, uh, you will see, we are able to do it. And according to Hirsch, the whole planning of the operation by the CIA and, the, uh, and other uh, US institutions started in um, December 2021. It was all before the invasion. In, two th in January uh, 2021, 22, they knew how to do it. And then Biden talked about it, which was not, uh, which was, was not planned. And according to Hirsch, the CIA officials were outraged that he talked about the plan. But um, it had one advantage, according to Hirsch, and that was that usually if you do a covert operation, and the US have done since World War II, I mean, thousands and thousands of covert operations blowing up all kinds of things. I mean, they have a track record of doing such, and they know how to do things. Uh, well, and according to Hirsch, um, the CIA and others said, well, normally we have to report covert operations to the US Congress by law. And But if Biden had announced it, if the president himself had announced it, we can bypass this and we can do it completely secretly because it's it's a public uh, almost a public thing now. And the interesting thing now is that our press hardly ever refers to President Biden having announced what they did later. And even after the deed, um, Victoria Newland, uh, under Secretary of State, uh, she said that, uh, well, we are delighted that Nord Stream now is a hunk of metal at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, that, that's the most severe act of international sabotage, or you could call it international terrorism, if you will, uh, in a long time. And the U.S., which is an ally of Germany, is uh, delighted that German, uh, German crucial energy infrastructure has been blown up. I mean, it's so open. It's so open. And... Uh, is Secretary Blinken and others have uh, made similar statements of being delighted. And uh, w which is really appalling, I, I think, is the way uh, many of our mainstream media are reporting on this. The Zeit didn't do a very well, a very good job, I think. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Holga Stark, who did the story for, who, for Die Zeit, a number of questions. He refused to give an interview. He even declined to answer a single question by email. Uh, so it's not very open. And I also wonder what the New York Times is doing here. I mean, it's getting some information by U.S. officials relying on some uh, um, uh, 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 on some intelligence, uh, I mean, they they have um, uh, they have deceived the public about the Iraq war, about the mass uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in 2003, and uh, later they apologized for that and they said we should have done more aggressive research on this. In this case, there's no re aggressive research again at all. They're just giving things. On, passing things on, given to them by the intelligence service. And what, what seems obvious to me is, and also to, to Jeremy Scale of The Intercept, is that this was a kind of cover story to distract the attention from the obvious mm, 
suspect here, which is the U.S. government, and to to uh, to make uh, to keep us busy looking into details of a story that doesn't uh, uh, that isn't plausible at all, and that has worked, unfortunately. I mean, we are talking about these. Uh, the sailboat now for months, and there has been a new article by the Washington Post in early April, and they didn't even mention Seymour Hersh and the obvious suspect in the room, the elephant in the room. It's just giving details on these destruction, destruction stories. Let me pick up on the Washington Post story that you just mentioned, which was released in April, and let me quote the title here, quote, investigators skeptical of Yacht's role in Nord Stream bombing, unquote. In this article, it is stated that German officials and investigators are skeptical that the yacht, the Andromeda, was not the only vessel used to bomb the Nord Stream pipeline. And it also voiced skepticism that a crew of six people on one sailboat were able to place hundreds of pounds of explosives. Poland and Ukraine were mentioned as po possible perpetrators given their motives. However, no suspicion was voiced towards the United States. Why do you think the press is so hesitant to mention United States as a perpetrator, especially given that it has the motives, means, and even circumstantial evidence to make it a suspect. I mean, the last question you have to ask uh, it, it, uh, to, uh, to those journalists in the Washington Post and the New York Times. The New York Times, I mean, Seymour Hirsch was a star reporter for the New York Times for decades. I mean, he broke the most important stories on My Lai, the massacres in the Vietnamese village of My Lai. He broke uh, the, the story of the um, CIA spy programs on uh, U.S. citizens. He broke the Abu Ghraib story and the Bin Laden story and so on and so forth. And uh, they, they have even failed to mention his piece, um, which was published uh, on Substack. And so, so the reporting is, has been very poor. And wh why do, don't they report on this? Uh, I have no answer. I have no answer because uh, I think uh, they are so afraid because uh, if it turns out that the U.S. really did it, uh, I mean, it's so damaging for the U.S. and it's extremely damaging for NATO. Uh, if the Germans would uh, say, and the, the German investigators who have access to uh, to the evidence and the Swedish um, uh, investigators and the Danish, and Sweden will be part of NATO soon as well. If they said, well, look, the US did it, and that could be the end of NATO. I mean, how can you keep on running a military alliance if, one, if the biggest part of that alliance uh, has bombed one of its allies. I mean, it's, it's impossible. I, and I think, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to foreign policy, many of the top journalists with German media like Die Zeit and Der Spiegel and also the New York Times and the Washington Post feel close to the administration. I mean, they are good reporters in these uh, outlets, but uh, when it comes to very serious and dangerous foreign policy information, they are much too close to power, and I think, and they are afraid of admitting the truth. And the the Washington Post article is really a hoax, if you will. But there's one interesting quote at the end, and I wonder if the journalist put it to give us a hint what he really thinks or she. I don't know if it was he or she. And uh, he or she said that uh, I quote: "It's like a corpse at a family gathering." The, the author of that article is quoting an unnamed European diplomat who, who is talking about why nobody is talking about Nord Stream in the European Union. And this diplomat said, well, it's like a corpse at a family gathering. Everyone can see there's a body lying there, but pretends things are normal. It's better not to know. That's how the article ends. No? But the author doesn't say, why isn't it better not to know? Because the obvious suspect is the US. I want to pick up on another story that appeared on the Nord Stream pipeline that was also briefly mentioned in the Tagesschau, Germany's leading primetime news channel, on the 28th of April. The news story mentioned that three Russian Navy ships were observed in the Baltic Sea in the area of the Nord Stream pipeline just prior to the sabotage. This investigation was led by four Nordic broadcasters and also confirmed by Denmark. The Nordic broadcasters included Denmark's DR, Norway's NRK, 
Sweden's SVT, and Finland's YLE. According to the broadcasters, Russian Navy ships were traced using satellite images and intercepted radio communication from the Russian fleet. Separately, Danish Armed Forces also confirmed that one of its patrol vessels had taken photos of a Russian submarine rescue vessel near the Nord Stream just days before the explosion happened. Do you think this story has enough evidence to implicate Russia? And what possible motives could Russia have to blow up its own pipeline? Yeah, well, first of all, there are so many ships in the Baltic Sea. I mean, it's densely populated like almost no other sea in the world by ships from all nations. Uh, and to say there were three ships around, uh, you, you will certainly find US ships around as well. And uh, there's a lot of open source intelligence about these ships. And uh, uh, apparently, I mean, the article by Reuters claims that uh, they switched off their uh, navigation tools, so, so they could not be that easily located. Uh, but uh, having see, uh, these ships in the area doesn't imply anything. And the Washington Post uh, a couple of months ago ran an article and they claimed that they had talked to uh, dozens of um, intelligence people and diplomats and so on from 10 or 12 countries. And they came up with uh, the story that there was no hint at all that Russia could be involved in, according to these intelligence people and according to the Washington Post, which is so close to the US government. So if there, there would there was any hint that the Russians were involved, it's certain that the Washington Post would have reported it and certain that the US government would have made a big story out of it. And these kind of stories pop up again and again and again to blame Russia and to distract, distract um, attention from, from the main uh, suspect. There was another story by um, an open source intelligent analyst called Oliver Alexander. This uh, person has been cited very often to um, claim that Seymour Hersh was wrong uh, with his story or originally, and there were some details in it. Seymour Hersh said there was a PH Norwegian airplane involved in dropping a sonar to uh, to 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 explode the bombs, and uh, Oliver Alexander wrote an article which was hugely cited, even more than the article by Sir by Seymour Hersh himself. And uh, Oliver Alexander stay, stated, well, it's not possible because we couldn't see the PH airplane in our open source intelligence. Well, Seymour himself said, and every uh, intelligent expert will tell you that if you run a covert operation, you will switch up everything that could make you being de detected by open source intelligence. That, that's routine. <laughs> that's routine in these operations. So that's what, and I wondered why Oliver Alexander didn't know about that. I mean, he himself said that, yet that you can switch off a P-8 airplane, uh, you can switch off the, 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 the tools that can make you being detected. And then uh, later, that's why I tell this story, Oliver Alexander came up with a story that uh, there was a Russian um, ship being located near the area and so on. So these stories come up and come up again and again and again. If you look at the case from a very from a criminalistic point, I mean, like in a whodunit. I mean, we have whodunits all the time on television. Why don't we look at this case in the way a police inspector would look at it? So you ask, who has a track record of having done such things? I mean, the US have blown up things all the time. Uh, who has said that they will do it? The U.S. has said it would do it. Who has cheered after the deed? The U.S. did. Who has the means to do it? The U.S. Has, certainly no, no other country has. The Russians would have the means as well, but uh, the U.S. Has also has the means. And who has the motives? And now we come to the motives. The U.S. has a huge number of motives. They have stated publicly over and over again that they are against this pipeline. The old one, the Nord Stream 1 and the Nord Stream 2 pipelines. Why are they against it? They are against it for because they have a long running tradition that they want to keep Russia and Western Europe, especially Germany, uh, separate. Because if Russian energy and Russian re resources merge with German and Western European knowledge and technology, well, and with China even, which is an ally of Russia, 
Well, you have the largest land mass in the world. You have resources, technology and everything. And America would become the periphery of the world system economically, in terms of power structures, uh, geographically and so on and so forth. So they would be off. So for decades, you can argue even for a century, they have to try to split Russia from Western Europe. And Ukraine, Ukraine, of course, is pivotal. That's why they are pumping so much money and weapons into Ukraine. And that's why they wanted to end Nord Stream. They said it, they did it. And they have other motives, which um, might be coincidental, but which, which might play have played a role, which is for a long time, they wanted to sell their LNG gas which is the most dirty energy source on the planet, even more dirty than coal, uh, if you take all the emissions uh, together. And now they have what they wanted. I mean, they sell their very expensive LNG gas to Germany instead of um, the Russians selling their much cheaper gas to Germany. So they are, And there's another motive that Simo Hirsch mentions, and that is, uh, the Germans had the possibility before the, the pipelines were bombed to switch on the pipelines again. That was in, remember, it was September 2022, the, the attacks. Uh, if it would have been a cold winter and German would, Germany would have run out of energy for heating for the industry and so on, there would have been a huge discussion of switching on that pipeline again, because uh, if people get cold and if the industry goes bust, I mean, better to switch off the pipeline. I mean, at least in the perspective of some politicians, at least. And uh, according to Hirsch, the Biden administration wanted, wanted to end this possibility uh, to switch on the pipeline, to have full support of Germany for the Ukraine war on the side of the, the US allies. Because if they had switched on the pipeline, of course, they would have had to have some conversation with Russia. They couldn't have gone so hard on Russia. So a number of motives. If you look at Russia, what's the motive to bomb your own infrastructure? If, if you want to stop the gas running through the pipeline, you just turn it off, you don't have to bomb your pipeline. Then there are some people who say, well, it might be an insurance problem. So if you turn it off, they had to pay a lot in, I don't know, legal cases. But who cares for legal cases in this war? The West didn't care for legality when they blocked uh, billions and billions of Russian assets in the, in the banks in the West, which, by the way, is one of the most important uh, uh, events in recent history because it changes the world financial system. That's another issue that we could talk about. But I mean, who cares about legality in this case? Uh, Russia wouldn't would certainly not pay any fine uh, for not uh, for not providing gas to. You. So there is no motive on the Russian side at all. Let us switch gears and move to some recent developments surrounding Ukraine. NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg visited Ukraine in May. Speaking alongside Ukrainian President Zelensky in Kyiv, he said, and let me quote him here, Ukraine's rightful place is in the Euro-Atlantic family. Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO, unquote. In our last interview with you, you advocated for a ceasefire following the model of the uh, uh, ceasefire that North and South Korea have agreed to, where although no official peace has been declared, nevertheless the killing has halted. Now that NATO is openly voicing Ukraine's rightful place in NATO, do you think a ceasefire, let alone peace, is even possible? Well, to answer this, we have to go back a little. I mean, we had serious negotiations for a ceasefire in March uh, 2022 right after the invasion of Russia. And these involved Turkey, and these involved uh, in secret negotiations, Naftali Bennett, the then uh, Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, they came up, the Ukraine came up with a proposal of a ceasefire agreement, which uh, mentioned neutrality, no NATO membership, Russia to withdraw to the lines of February 23 and uh, some negotiations on the status of Donbass and Krim later on. So that was, a, a, according to Bennett, he said there was a good chance that a ceasefire agreement could have been reached. And that would have been much more than the ceasefire agreement in Korea, because there has been no political proposals. It's just stop the war. 
no political solutions. And these proposals by Ukraine uh, really uh, had already the ingredients for peace negotiations. Um, and uh, so we don't know exactly why this has stopped. Uh, this has stopped, uh, according to some. Uh, it was because of Bucha, the massacres in Bucha, uh, allegedly by, by Russian troops. Uh, but Zelensky himself, after visiting Bucha, said, well, that makes it harder to negotiate, but we need peace. And we will go on both with war effort and with the negotiations. So apparently he didn't drop the negotiations after Bucha. But uh, Boris Johnson visited Kiev on April 9, 2022. And after that, the negotiations collapsed. And there's a lot of other sources which indicate that that might have played a role that the West, especially Britain and the US, didn't want the war to stop at that point and said to Zelensky, well, we don't support these negotiations. We don't support the ceasefire. And that means even if uh, Boris Johnson wouldn't have told uh, Zelensky, stop it, uh, stop the negotiations, even if he said we don't support it, I mean, Zelensky had hardly a choice because he is 100% dependent on Western money. I mean, without Western money, the economy collapses <laughs> in a very short period. So uh, that was the prehistory. Now we we have a completely different situation. I mean, we have uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of death and wounded in the war. Uh, we have trauma on both sides. We have Russia have, has annexed uh, not only the, Don, uh, the northern Donbass, but also southern, southern Donbass. And it makes it much, much harder to negotiate now. But uh, I think um, we have no other choice for many reasons. Uh, the first one is that the risk of nuclear war becomes higher and higher as we go uh, on with that war. And that's a risk that nobody can take. I mean, it's an absolute no-go to take the risk of nuclear war. I mean, that means we will all die. Nuclear war is not, you cannot uh, restrict it to a certain area. If you're in nuclear war, you have this kind of ex escalation. Then you will have a destruction of the northern hem hemisphere uh, that will lead to a nuclear winter, which will devastate the global south as well. So it's end game. We should never do that. The second reason for why we should go for negotiations is that it's a stalemate. That's what General Milley, the chief of the joint, uh, chief of uh, chairman of the joint, joint chiefs of staff, the highest military in the U.S., uh, said a couple of months ago. That's what the Pentagon leak. Uh, recently showed. I mean, these were secret Pentagon um, documents which showed that the Pentagon itself says it's a stalemate. That means neither Ukraine nor Russia can win. Well, if you go on with the stalemate, you will have, have at least Verdun. Verdun, you will remember, is the uh, the battle with uh, hundreds and thousands of deaths uh, between France and Germany uh, in the First World War, which has been uh, uh, a symbol for senseless wars. So that's another reason. And the third reason is that we have other global issues which are so urgent that we need global cooperation, climate change, biodiversity loss. They are existential. We are in the decade where we have to turn our economy to a sustainable path very quickly. Otherwise, glo global ecosystems will collapse. And that means human civilization will collapse. That's what the most eminent scholars in the world tell us about what's going to happen if we go on with it. You cannot stop climate change without global cooperation, including with Russia and China. So there are a number of reasons why we should do that. It's much harder than it used to be a year ago. But I think um, maybe not in the next weeks or months, but in the long run, if it turns out to be a real stalemate, both parties and even the West will gain an interest in, in ending this war. Let me pick up on the point you made about uh, the potential for nuclear war and pose a counter argument. Um, in the German media, it is always argued when experts are invited that, hey, when we were saying uh, sending defensive weapons could lead to nuclear war, war, once they were sent, there was no nuclear war, nothing happened. Then there was about uh, sending offensive weapons um, and the same 
uh, warnings that you made, for example, about nuclear war, nothing happened. Then advanced uh, weapons were sent and uh, now sending fighter jets and other stuff uh, can be said as well because uh, they argue there's much more room for flexibility and Putin would never use nuclear weapons given how uh, nuclear winter and the fallout would affect his own country. So there's a lot of room to play here. What do you make about this argument? Well, first of all, the, the main risk of nuclear war is not that one of the sides, uh, either the Russians or the Americans, press the red button. Uh, the main danger is that you have misunderstandings, that you have um, technological failure, that you have human failure. And you have to study the history of nuclear weapon, weapons and the almost nuclear wars that we had. The most uh, well-known incident was, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1950s. We came very close to nuclear confrontation, but very few people know what really happens and how close it was. It, just let me briefly tell you what, what happened. Uh, Khrushchev uh, of the USSR told his uh, submarine captains that if there is no connection to Moscow, then uh, three captains can decide to new to use nuclear weapons uh, and uh, uh, the us didn't know about that they didn't know it and they started to drop bombs on uh, and chase uh, the 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 submarines of the ussr near cuba and so the three captains uh, convened and they talked to each other and one said no, I don't do it. So it was one general or admiral or whatever of the Russian fleet that prevented nuclear war. <laughs> you have these kind of misunderstandings. The Americans, maybe they wouldn't have ch chased these, these submarines if they knew what happened. But, you know, you know, if they don't talk to each other, you can get this kind of situation. And we had dozens and dozens of incidents. There's a book about it. I don't recall the name, but it's, it's, it's very instructive. And there was another incident in the 80s. Under the Reagan administration, NATO had a major maneuver uh, in Europe. And um, it was so realistic that the Russians thought, well, they're going to invade. And on the Russian radar there was, it seemed that there was a, a, a Western rocket coming and the, the person in charge, the officer in charge, then decided not to report it to his authorities and uh, eventually to Brezhnev that would have meant nuclear war. He decided for himself not to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, Zain. We wouldn't be here. I think this, this, uh, this officer should have um, a monument in really every city around the world, because we're here thanks to this person. And that means nuclear war due to misunderstandings is so likely. And it becomes much more likely if confrontation builds up, even with defensive weapons. And what the West is now providing are not defensive weapons. I mean, Leopard 2 <laughs> tanks are not defensive at all. So it's serious. It's very serious. On 3rd May, it was World Press Freedom Day. Uh, you were on the streets holding a speech uh, at a demonstration for Julian Assange organized by grassroots citizens. Uh, we received some complaints about uh, the speech not uh, being in English. So could you quickly summarize the speech and also talk about the importance this case has on press freedom and democracy? Yes, the, 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 the speech has been published by Sheer Post now in English and it's also available in French, Spanish and so on. Um, well, uh, the Assange case is instructive and very interesting in, in many regards. First of all, it shows that we live in an inverted and perverted world. Julian Assange has disclosed um, war crimes by Western nations in Iraq, Afghanistan and elsewhere. Now, none of those uh, suspects of war crimes has been charged or tried or convicted. Julian Assange, on the contrary, is jailed, has been jailed for four years in Belmarsh prison, high security pr prison, although he is not charged with any misdeed in Britain, the European Union or his home country of Australia. The only reason why he's in jail is that the US is asking, um, demanding his extradition 
on the ground of uh, World War I draconian law against espionage, the Espionage Act. Now, Julian Assange is a journalist. He acted as a journalist, as a responsible journalist, and not as a spy. If he is extradited to the US, that means that every journalist on this planet has to fear to be extradited to the US if she or she uh, discloses any misdeeds or dirty secrets of our government. That would be the end of free journalism as we know it. So that's why it is a very important case. And what the UK has been doing here is really outrageous. I mean, uh, Niels Melzer, the former UN Rapporteur on Torture, who visited Assange in Belmarsh when he was the UN Rapporteur, concluded that he has been tortured for years by the US government because of the extradition charge, by the UK government, and also by the uh, Ecuadorian government, which imprisoned him. I mean, the first Ecuadorian government under Rafael Correa gave him refuge, and the second one uh, changed very much course and uh, finally uh, delivered him to, to the British authorities. Uh, so that's why it's important. And uh, it's also important for the history of wars and our future, because reporting on the dirty secrets of wars is crucial, first of all, to prevent them from happening again. The reporting on the Vietnam War by people like Seymour Hersh and others, Daniel Isle spoke with the Pentagon Papers, which uh, uh, revealed that all US governments had lied to the American people about the Vietnam War, about its scope, its motives, and so on, the atrocities. The same with the Iraq War. If you reveal these atrocities, it's much harder for a government like the US government to wage another war. No? And if you don't reveal the secrets of the wars, it's much easier. So it's a matter of life and death to have good journalism reporting on the war. If you have good journalism reporting the ongoing wars, it's likelier that these wars will end sooner because there's pressure on the governments. That's why the free journalism is linked to a matter of war and peace and life and death for us all. Fabian Scheidler, independent journalist and author, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for tuning in today. Please don't forget to join our alternative channels on Rumble and Telegram. YouTube, which is owned by Google, has a long history of shadow banning and censoring content of alternative and independent media outlets such as ours. So we're asking all our viewers as a precaution to join these channels. Also, if you're watching our videos regularly, make sure to take into account that there's an entire team working behind the scenes from camera, light, audio, and in the case of our German videos, translation, voice over correction. So if you want us to provide you with independent nonprofit news and analysis, make sure to donate today. I'm your host, Zain Raza. See you guys next time.